our verse for call to worship, Psalm 118, verses 22 and 23. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. And we thank the Lord for that profound statement from Scripture this morning.
take you care of. She asked us a question, didn't she? Isn't that wonderful? Amen. Children are dismissed to junior church. If the rest of you would turn to number 355, if you need it, for Jesus paid it all, and then stand together with me. Jesus paid it all. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He was it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find thy power and thine alone can change the leper spots and melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. For nothing good have I whereby thy grace to claim. I'll wash my garments white. In the blood of Calvary's Lamb, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. And when before the throne, I stand in him complete. Jesus died my soul to save. My lips will still repeat. Thank you. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I've been debating whether to have a commercial because I'm coming to the table. Uh, you might guess that Kara wrote that song herself. She's written several. Uh, she has a number of them up on YouTube. You'll find them equally thought-provoking and beautiful and uh, very reflective and worshipful, and I enjoy that and appreciate it very much. And that question that she asked us, do you still have the awe? It rings with me, doesn't it, you? It's so easy to be spoiled, isn't it? We get used to a thing. When we're first saved, we realize how profound it is that the God of all creation became human and became human essentially ultimately to die for us, to die for me, to pay the price of my sin on Calvary's cross. He suffered what he suffered for me. He was there because of me, because of my shortcomings, because of my willful sin. The story is told of a man who had a dream, and in that dream he saw a Roman soldier with a nasty whip in his hand lashing the Savior's back time and again without mercy, lashing the Savior's back. And the man in his dream was concerned and ran to the, to the man with the whip, took hold of him, spun him around, and beheld his face. And the man of the dream says, I beheld his face, and it was my own. Truly, that's a dream. There's no chapter and verse on that, but truly, we put the Savior then. He was wounded for our transgressions. Uh, our chastisement was upon him. By his stripes, we are healed. He died in our place. How amazing is that? And too often we go about our day-to-day -day life and we don't stop to ponder 
And so what a per perfectly apt question. Do you still have the awe? Matthew, our scripture reading. Matthew 26, verses 26 through 30, if you'd follow as I read. Matthew 26, 26. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Verse 30, after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Uh, it is a telling little verse at the end of this profound passage of Scripture where the Savior institutes what we've come to call his table. They were eating the Seder meal at the outset of the Passover week. On the cusp, on the eve of Passover, they ate the Seder meal. The Seder meal involved several elements, all of them reflective and reminding of the time spent in Egypt and the work of God to deliver them from Egypt, even eating the bitter herbs and so forth. Uh, and it was imperative, and in practicing Jewish households today, it is still imperative there be no yeast, no leaven in the house. It was unleavened bread. A, they weren't to wait for it, but mostly the scripture uses leaven or yeast as a little picture of a, as a picture of something really little that does an awful lot comparative to its size. Uh, my mother, I, I still get teary-eyed when I smell something baking, well, especially the better it smells, the more it smells like my mom's kitchen. Uh, my mom spent her summers with her Danish grandmother learning how to bake, and that oven was mom's happy place, and it was my happy place too. Uh, but uh, I remember those times when the yeast was forgotten, and the rolls didn't rise, and the bread didn't rise, and ugh, you know, nothing like the same. But the picture that the scripture uses, and the Lord uses it himself in the New Testament, he tells the disciples, beware of the leaven, the yeast of the Pharisees. What he means by that is this little tiny thought that they hold and harbor that warps their thinking about everything else. It's a little tiny bit of yeast that means that bread rises or doesn't rise. That little bitty sprinkle of it makes all the difference in the world. And so the picture of leaven here is you don't want to take it with you. What they were to do was to leave all of Egypt in Egypt. Did they? No. They whined. Why can't we go back to Egypt? We ate better in Egypt. I'm tired of eating manna. God let it rain bread. Think of how profound that is. But you can imagine what it was like to eat bread every day for years, right? Please let us have something else. Please, anything else. Um, they whined. They went back to sin and sinful ways. They went back to idolatry very, very quickly. They went back to what they knew, even though it was awful and horrible and oftentimes sinful, they went right back to it. And you and I looking back through history and the written word of the Old Testament, cluck our teeth and shake our head and think we'd never be anything like that. But aren't we, though? We go back to sinful days. We go back to days we might have been saved but didn't have victory. We go back to days before we were saved. We go back to sinful thoughts and sinful habits and sinful comforts and sinful pleasures and sinful distractions as if Christ didn't die for us and pay the price for us so that we were no longer slaves to sin. We live as we please and we go back and we whine about back in Egypt the same as the Israelites did. At the end of this passage, as they've eaten this profound meal, the Lord breaks bread and gives it new significance. This is my body. This is representative of my body. All of you take a bite. This represents my body. 
he passed the cup. There had been several commemorative cups gone round the table. He gave a new cup, and he gave it a new meaning. He says, this cup is the new covenant, the new testament in my blood. All of you drink from it. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show the Lord's death till he come. You demonstrate it. You go through motions. You look at very, very, very sinful, sinful, not the word I wanted, forgive me, simple elements. I'm going to blame the leftovers of that cough drop. Simple elements. They couldn't be more simple. Bread and juice. It's Welch's if you're wondering. Our, our folks are, have spoiled us on that. Uh, but these simple, simple elements, he says it extra so you forget the time he said it wrong, are to remind us of what the Savior did for us. Just that simple. And at the end of the Seder meal, at the end of the institution of the Lord's table, they sang a hymn and they went out to the Mount of Olives. The Garden of Gethsemane was on the Mount of Olives. That was their next stop. But not before they sang a hymn. All my life, I've gone to church. I mean, stories are told of me turning out the lights on our country church in northern Indiana when I was a little fella and a deacon was holding me on his lap because mom was leading the choir and dad was at the pulpit. And, uh, you know, he was bouncing me on his lap and I hit the lights. You can see it happening. I mean, since my first week on earth, I've gone to church. And I've gone to so many communion messages. And I've told you before, I got saved at communion as a seven-year-old. I realized that I'd never trusted Christ personally. I realized I was lost and bound for hell. A Christless eternity there. But you know how many times I've heard the preacher read after they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Why the hymn, and what was the hymn? Well, the hymn would be one of the Hallel Psalms. The Hallel Psalms, I was always confused by the name Hallel. When I taught in Virginia, there was a little girl in the elementary school whose name was Hallel, and I thought, you know, what a funny name. Where did that come from? Well, when I finally started to study out, that's just the beginning of Hallelujah, and so it makes perfect sense there, doesn't it? We might call them the Hallelujah Psalms. The Hallel Psalms were sung in worship, they were sung corporately together. They were sung antiphonally. That is, one person who was leading, or one side, I believe, on either side of the road as the Lord entered Jerusalem. You know, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, sang one side of the road, and the other sang back, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. That was the nature of antiphonal singing. These psalms, Psalm 113 to 118, were meant to be sung antiphonally, that is, one part would be sung by one party and then others would echo back. So it must have been a very beautiful thing to hear. Psalm 118 is most likely the one that was read. It's certainly the one that fits the very best to the Savior and, and to that night. I borrowed only the title because I don't have anything else from it. But I borrowed my title this morning from my dad, our singing Savior, uh, Matthew 26 and Psalm 118. After they had sung a hymn, well, after the Seder meal, they would sing one or more of the Hillel Psalms. And as you'll see, and I'll, I'll take some time, a little bit of time to read 118 today. We're not going to go through it verse by verse. We don't have near the time. But I think it's well for us to read it together. And I'll ask you to follow either in your Bible or here. Uh, by the way, I, I'm using the ESV. I rarely do. I'm a New American Standard kind of guy. Really, there's just one reason for that. Uh, oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. The word that's translated steadfast love is chesed, C-H-E-S-E-D, is how it comes into English letters, chesed or chesed, and that is translated mercy, it's translated loving kindness. At its core, it has the idea of steadfast, count on it, stable, always there, love. And so this psalm is written to praise the Lord for his steadfast love. And you and I will see what makes this such a special psalm. Uh, you've heard me many times talk about Martin Luther in Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And realizing that when Christ said those words on the cross, it was a quote of a psalm that had been written hundreds and hundreds of years earlier. And putting together that Jesus had known all along the price that he was going to pay, and that it was the plan of the author of Scripture, God Almighty, that this was the price that Jesus was going to pray, pay, and that his Psalm 22 was very much a prayer.
from the Savior written all those years before. It describes the cross more distinctly than any of the gospel records, and it was written hundreds of years before. Psalm 118 was Martin Luther's personal favorite psalm. He found great strength in it. He said it had helped him out of troubles out of which neither emperor nor king nor any other man on earth could have helped him. So think about as we read and, and, and ponder these words from Psalm 118, think about what made it so special to a great reformer like Martin Luther. Think about how it must have, what the disciples must have thought a couple days later when they realized what Jesus was leading them in for a song and what it must have meant to Jesus to sing these words. Verse one, oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say his steadfast love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say his steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say his steadfast love endures forever. He calls on them nationally. He calls on the priesthood. He calls on those who fear the Lord to say with him, boldly, pleasantly, celebrating the Lord's steadfast love endures forever. He talks of personal testimony, verse 5. Out of my distress I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. The Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. By the way, out of my distress, the word distress has the literal meaning of a very tight and uncomfortably tight place. I won't ask for hands, but I'm guessing I'm not the only claustrophobic person in the room. I don't like tight spaces. I don't know if it started with an event. If it did, it was in Oak Knoll Park in Oakland, California, in the, in the hills uh, right below the, the Oakland Zoo. There was this park we used to go to for a uh, picnic twice a year, and they had a, a cement pipe that was painted up and made into playground equipment. They didn't really think the playground equipment through when I was a kid. It's a wonder we didn't all die. And I got partway through this, this pipe and I decided I didn't want to keep going. I wanted to turn around. I got partway through turning around and realized turning around was not a good idea. And I got myself stuck. And I probably wasn't really all that tremendously stuck, but I didn't know how to get out of it. And I was stuck there for a couple minutes and I hated every minute of it. And tight spaces, oh, praise the Lord, I've only had to, to lay down for one MRI so far in my life, and it was not easy. And if I can do it next time, please sedate me. That's where I am. I identify with the psalmist who can't stand a tight spot. That tight spot may mean in a claustrophobic sense. It also might mean I'm in sense of just difficulty. I'm hemmed in. I can't do anything. I have no good choices. I'm in a tight spot. And then when it says, the Lord answered and set me free, literally there, he, he set me in a large space. He set me in a large space. He put me someplace safe where I could breathe and, and where I could feel at ease. He set me in a large place. The Lord is on my side. I'll not fear. What can mere man do to me? What can a human do? I have God on my side. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. Verse 10, all nations surrounded me. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me, surrounded me on every side. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me like bees. They went out like a fire coming, or a fire among thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I was pushed hard so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. We read in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, the kenosis passage. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore also hath God highly exalted, our word, exalted him, 
and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth, and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The psalmist, the right hand of the Lord does valiantly, the right hand of the Lord exalts. Jesus obeyed. Jesus paid it all. And because of that, God has exalted him, has exalted his name, his identity, his reputation, his name, above every name anywhere. That at the very mention of his name, every knee will bow. This world is going insane around us. Right is wrong, up is down, black is white, good is evil, evil is good. This world is corrupt and corrupting everywhere. But one day, dear friend, at the very mention of the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Amen? Amen. Every knee. The hand of the Lord does valiantly. The hand of the Lord exalts. Verse 17, I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Peter and Acts chapter 2, this first sermon at Pentecost, the first really New Testament sermon ever, uh, he quotes from the Psalms, and he talks about how it was impossible for the grave to hold the Lord. Yes, he died. He died completely. He died, died a real death. Incidentally, after three days in the tomb, he rose again. Do you know why three days is so important? Jesus prophesied it. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the, of the fish, so will the Son of Man himself be in the belly of the earth, in the grave. Three days matters. Uh, also, in the ancient Jewish mindset, that was how they were sure somebody was dead and not long-term unconscious or in a coma. If they were still dead, unmoving after three days, they were officially dead. And they were not officially dead until after three days. Jesus had to be in that tomb for three days. Verse 19, open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. Ponder verse 22, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. In the day when people built with stone foundations, they were picky about their stones. In our day, typically a building, a large edifice will still have a cornerstone. Sometimes they make it a time capsule, they put things in the hollow of it. Uh, I had to do a practice teaching run when I was in college and I had to teach my college class as if they were a high school Bible class. I took them on a field trip for Ephesians chapter two where we were talking about Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone and I walked them to the cornerstone of the university's main building, and that was where we had our lesson, and everybody liked it, it was fresh air, and I had to learn how to discipline a class when they were out and could hear the birdies chirp and watch the squirrels run, and you know. Uh, but the cornerstone has significance in our building today for reasons non-structural, but in their day, the cornerstone was the first stone laid. It squared two walls. It gave strength to the pillar of one foundation. Even building, I've not watched somebody lay up a stone foundation. Uh, I, I sleep on top of one every night, but I didn't watch it go together in 1822. I've watched some fellows make stone walls. I've watched some fellows in this room make stone walls. And they're looking for just the right stone to put into place. And sometimes the stone just goes over the shoulder because it just doesn't fit. The stone that the builders tossed over shoulder, the stone that they rejected and had no use for at all, not at the corner, not at the foundational base, not even up at the top where it didn't matter near as much, they had no use at all. That has become the chief cornerstone, the be-all and end-all stone of all eternity is Jesus Christ. Only God could do that, and it's wonderful in our eyes. And Jesus most likely sang this the night he was betrayed, the night before he died. Verse 24, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Anybody else 
when you were a tired, grumpy, early morning teenager, have your parents sing that in your ear? Or am I alone? But think of how profound this is. This is the Savior within about 15 hours of the cross singing, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day that he had known was coming forever. This is the day the Lord has made. We'll rejoice and be glad in it. Verse 25, save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus had heard those words sung to him as he came in on that donkey a few days earlier on Palm Sunday. People were celebrating his arrival. They were throwing their outer cloaks down so that his donkey didn't have to get his feet dirty. They took palm fronds, which is why we call it Palm Sunday, and they laid them down in front of that donkey so he wouldn't get his feet dirty. And they sang from either side of the road back and forth, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And a few days later when they shouted, it was crucify him, crucify him. Verse 27, the Lord is God and he has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. You are my God and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his steadfast love endures forever. Imagine our Savior singing that that night. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. In his essential being, God is good in every sense. And his steadfast love endures forever. Take our attention to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. If you'd follow as I read, beginning at verse 23. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. What we come before today is not a mass. It's not Eucharist. It is not a re-crucifixion of Christ. Christ could not be crucified again. These elements are not the body and blood of Christ. They do not become the body and blood of Christ. The body and blood of Christ is not supernaturally present next to them. This is, thankfully, homemade, gluten-free cracker and Welch's grape juice. This cracker is a near representation of unleavened bread to remind us that Jesus physically died for us. He gave his body for our salvation. This juice, a picture of the blood that was shed. Scripture has told us and demonstrated ever since the garden, without shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And Jesus' blood paid for our eternal salvation. This is a memorial service. You're not going to get saved by partaking. You're not going to get some supernatural blessing by partaking. You're going to be obedient to the Lord in partaking. He has said, as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. Here you have it. We do not, do not, do not re-crucify Christ. It could not be done. It would be a shame to even pretend that we re-crucify Christ. This is a memorial service with these simple elements. Verse 27, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. We come today with this very distinct admonition, with very high stakes. For this cause, many. That's not a couple, a single, a few, it's many. Many are weak and sickly, and some even die, because they misused the table of the Lord. They came in an unworthy manner. 
What does that mean? How can I be worthy? Two essential things. The first, front and foremost, I must be sure that I know Jesus personally as my Savior. I am trusting in Jesus crucified and coming again and nothing else for my eternal salvation from sin. Jesus died for me and rose again. And if I'm stopped at the gate of heaven and asked for my right of entrance, that is my only answer. Jesus died for me in my place and he rose again in victory. That's what I'm counting on for my salvation. If you're not sure or if you're counting on anything else, let the elements pass and tap me on the shoulder. Let's talk as soon as we can. But if you're not sure, don't let, don't take part. Second is that we have no sin that we know about that we haven't made right with God. 1 John 1, 9 is a wonderful, blessed passage. If we own up to our sin, if we confess it, if we own up to our sin, He is faithful, He is just. He'll forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He'll scrub us clean. He'll forgive us legally. He'll scrub us clean and cleanse us from the unrighteous thoughts, words, and deeds of our sinful selves. If we have something we haven't given to the Lord, if we've sinned and we haven't made it right with Him. You ever think about how the Bible calls David a man after God's own heart? There's another passage that says David didn't sin except for the matter of she who had been the wife of Uriah. In other words, when he had an affair with Bathsheba and then killed her husband, that was the only time he sinned. Scripture tells us many other times that David sinned. So what's the difference? Why does this one get singled out and held? Because for nine, almost ten months, the whole time Bathsheba was expecting his baby, David didn't make it right with the Lord. If we confess our sin, he's faithful, he's just, he'll forgive us and cleanse us. We need to make it right with him. So do you know the Lord, and have you made things right with him? So let's take a couple moments for silent prayer as we get ready to partake. <clears throat> The Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread.
given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup. Precious Father, we are truly grateful for this opportunity to be together to remember that day on the cross of Calvary. Oh Lord, we think of our lifestyles and the way we live our lives and we ponder the many things that our Lord and Savior did in his lifetime. And our lives are truly a mess, Lord because we sin each and every day. Oh, Father, we ask and pray that we would not forget uh, all the things that uh, we do in a day's time and then take time before the evening's through to bow before our Lord and ask forgiveness for our sins. Oh, our Father, you have sent your Son into the world to pay the price for those sins. And how can we, how dare we take uh, that for granted? We need to spend more time in the Word. We need to spend more time praying about our Lord and thanking for the grace that you have given to each one of us. Father, we ask and pray that uh, as we uh, go from this place, that it would be on our minds, Lord, the remembrance, the time that we've shared. But Lord, let it not be just this hour and uh, one week of the month, but each and every hour of the day, Lord, to remember that our Lord and Savior paid an ultimate sacrifice for our sins. Mm. Lord, it is uh, truly a lifestyle that we need to change. But most of all, Lord, we need to focus on you each and every day to be faithful to thee. Thank you for the time we've had today. Let us go with your blessings, and may you always be exalted and glorified. We thank you in Jesus' name.
took the cup, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. There is a basket in the back for um, Deacon's Fund offering. The Deacon's Fund is a benevolent fund at Pilgrim Baptist where folks give to help each other. Uh, 90 to 95% of it is regular attenders of church when they have uh, a need and the rest is for people in the community that reach out for help. And uh, we're just the, the in-between men, the deacons and I, and we rejoice in that. People, God's people have been very generous to each other through the years and helped each other out and we're very glad for it. Let's stand together and uh, let's sing together. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Just the chorus as we close. Hector, would you close in prayer, brother? Worthy is the Lamb.